الحمد لله نحمد سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين we are still continuing to track the subject of people in the Qur'an, what the Qur'an says about people and what the Qur'an says to people. Very important issue. And you will discover as we go forward that the whole of the Qur'an is about people. The whole of the Qur'an is about you. The Qur'an is sent for you. It is talking to you, about you, about your environment, about your community, about your needs, about your wants, about your situation, about your condition, about your future, about your fate, about your life, about your death. It's all about you. So very important. And of course, as the Quran talks about you and talks to you, the Qur'an talks to all matters that matter for us. We are creatures. So we need to know about our Creator. So the Qur'an talks about Allah. The Qur'an talks about Allah so much so and as much as is needed for us. So the Qur'an does not talk about the description of a physical or a spiritual being that we worship. It doesn't tackle those issues because they are irrelevant to where we are or our faith or anything else. So the Quran talks about the holy names of Allah. The Quran talks about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran talks about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So only the issues that matter for our faith or for our living and our wants and needs does the Quran address us. In the process, the Quran picks some examples from the communities that preceded ours, the communities that came before the advent and the commission of the Prophet ﷺ, like the Christians, the Jews, and others. So the Qur'an picks those two major closest communities to ours as a sample community to look at, to benefit from their good stuff, and to learn lessons from their behavior or bad practice or pitfalls. So the purpose is for us to learn and pick lessons. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ There has been in their life, in their experience, lessons for those who have reflective hearts and reflective conscience. So as we went forth, the Qur'an talked to us about the children of Israel and we reached the point where Allah is speaking an overarching lesson. And we spoke about this slide, this ayah, 62, last time. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Last time, a kind sister pointed to me that uh, some of the tafsir have said a riwaya or a narration on Ibn Abbas that this ayah is actually abrogated. But I reviewed her reference with her and it is not abrogated. Ibn Abbas uses the ayah of Surah Al Imran saying, وَمَن يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهِ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ who picks any religion other than Al-Islam, 
it will never be accepted from him and he will be among the losers. That is his ijtihad. But the statement in the ayah he cites as abrogating this ayah, they have little to do with each other. This ayah, the one that you see on the slide here, ayah 62 of Surah Al-Baqarah, is establishing a general principle. And we explained this last time. Inna ladina amanu, those who have believed. And walladina hadu, those who kept coming back. As we explained, hada yahud bima'na yarja. They keep coming back to sinfulness. And when pressured, they keep coming back to Allah to forgive them and to repent. Then he forgives them. They go back to the same old habits. Then when pressed, they come back. So that's why the name Hadu. الَّذِينَ Hadu. Hadu is a verb. And the Yahud are the ones who keeps coming back. This is where the name comes from. So the, uh, the ayah here is talking about the believers and the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, those who have left idol worshipping and started to worship Allah according to the old teaching of Ibrahim and Ismail, they were called Saba'a Fulan. Saba'a means that he apostated, what we use in current terms. In, he left the religion of his forefathers. So the mushrikeen would call a person who goes back to the original teaching of Ibrahim and Ismail as Saba'a. And they said the same thing about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And their claim against the Prophet is he apostated. He is not anymore following the religion of his fa fathers or forefathers who worshipped idols. So Sabi'een means the believers who could not swallow polytheism as a religion, could not understand that worshipping idol is something that would be acceptable by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And they started to worship Allah ala al hanifiyyat al samha according to the deen of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Albeit that it is not perfectly the same, it has been polluted by inheritance and customs and traditions like our situation today. Deen of al-Islam today in our society and elsewhere in the Muslim world has been polluted, if not by misunderstanding internally, it is by outside external injections of cultures and customs and habits that have been either imposed, like in, in Algeria and the, the North Africa French occupation, or by the British occupation to the rest of the Muslim world. So those cultures left their footprints on our world. So our Islam, as we have it today, not that we have a special Islam, but our practice of Islam has been polluted by those injections and those inventions, whether it is internal or external. The same thing happened before the advent and the commission of the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah in this ayah is saying, for those people to be acceptable by Allah, there is a condition. What is the condition? Man amana billah. Well, but doesn't this apply to the first category? Inna ladina amanu, it does. But the condition continues. Inna ladina man amana billah, he who believes in Allah. Wal yawmil akhir, that's an extension, right? And then, wa amila salihan. To differentiate between claiming to be a believer and between practicing what you believe in. Because as we said in the hadith of the Prophet Al-Iman ma waqara fil qalb wa saddaqahu al-amal Faith is what settles in the heart of belief and is supported and confirmed by the action. So without the action, the Quran recognizes it as a faith. But it is not the faith that will take you to paradise. This is not my statement. It is what Allah says in Surah Al-An'am. يَوْمَ يَأْتِي بَعْضُ آيَاتِ رَبِّكَ لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ آمَنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَوْ كَسَبَتْ فِي إِيمَانِهَا خَيْرًا 
So Iman without earning goodness doesn't help. It is described in this ayah in Surah Al-An'am as useless faith. Faith but useless. So what makes it useful and productive and beneficial? It is one of two things. You believe before dying or you've believed before then you must have earned something good through your faith. So faith is intended to produce a certain character, a certain behavior, a certain thought, a certain choice. If our choices and behavior and talk and contracts and everything else we do have nothing to do with Islam, then our Islam becomes useless faith. And to dig this deeper and to understand that it is really useless, you need to know the outcome. Because Isa and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa they both said, by their fruits, you will know them. You will know the believer by the fruits the believer produces. You receive the world in a miserable condition, but you leave it in a totally different, pleasant state because you want to give the next generation something better. So the purpose of being a Muslim is to be the cleansing factor of your environment. Some of us do the opposite. We adjust our faith to the reality. We impose the reality on our faith. And how do we do this? We succumb to the reality by saying everybody is doing the same thing, right? Everybody is doing this. All the kids, oh, they are all dressed like this. They are all dating. They are all this. As such that we succumb, we cave in and make the reality our standard. And instead of making our values and principle the standard to measure the reality, whether the reality is acceptable to Allah or it needs our work to change it. So in the case of the children of Israel, as you will see here, they did not meet the criteria of being a change agent. They succumbed to each other's violations of the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll get to know what the punishment was for them. But here, the ayah is not abrogated because its meaning continues to be correct. Those who believed, those who have been coming back to Allah or to the, their sinfulness, and the Christians and the Sabians, he who believes in Allah and the latter day and does righteous deeds, there shall be no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. That stays to be correct. So the, the issue with Ibn Abbas's uh, statement is about thinking that since Allah set a clear rule, Nobody has an excuse to continue to be Christian, to continue to be Jewish, or to continue to be a Sabian. But this has nothing to do with this ayah. It really doesn't. All what the ayah says, he who ultimately ends up in a faith other than submission to Allah, that will never be accepted of him. So in what way are these two ayat consistent? and non-contradictory because we look for abrogation if there is a contradiction. Abrogation means something is, oh, you cannot reconcile it. But the reconciliation is very simple. Those who believe man amana billah wal yawm al akhir wa amila salihan it means exactly to be a Muslim. That's what it means. So it is consistent, it's not abrogated. I just wanted to clarify this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ And behold and remember, when we took your covenant and we raised above you the mount, it doesn't say which mount, but the Mufassireen would tell you that most probably it is Mount Sinai where they were. It is the mount where the, the, he, Moses gave the covenant to Allah on their behalf and they committed to the same. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ and we lifted over your head the mount. Right? What does this mean? Get the image in your head. Allah is saying, 
that he lifted the mount over their head. What does this mean? Is there a more serious threat than this? Allah is holding the mount over their head and he's threatening. Take whatever we've given you with power, commitment, discipline, and strength. Brothers, this is very serious because their threat is our warning. So don't look just as history. Look at it as also a warning for you because Allah will not favor a community over another except for good deeds and righteous behavior. That's the difference. You believe, they believe, he believes, fine. But the most, the most important issue is, do you practice your faith better than they did? Or do you engage in the same behavior? And we'll get to know some details of their behavior. خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ so the question for us is, are we taking the Qur'an with strength, power, and discipline? Do we feel empowered to refer to the Qur'an? Biqawwa. The Qur'an has power. And Allah is asking us and instructing us to take it with power. Which means what? Grip it. Don't hold it with a loose hand. In the hadith of the Prophet explaining this, he says, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا فَلَنْ تَضِلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا I have left you with two things that if you stick to, you will never go astray. كتاب الله وسنتي The book of Allah and my sunnah, my practice, my tradition. Right? And then he says, عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِزْ Bite on it. Amazing. He's not saying hold it very strong. He's saying bite on it. Hold it between your teeth. Very, very strong image here. That you bite it means never leave it. Never lose it. So the question is, are we biting on the book of Allah? Are we holding on? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى He who denies any worship to anyone or anything other than the worship of Allah and believes in Allah, he has held on to the tight knot on the robe of Allah. There is such a thing called حَبْلُ الله, The robe of Allah. The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, describes حَبْلُ الله describes the Qur'an as Hablullah. In the hadith, huwa Hablullah al-Mateen, wa dhikr al-Hakim, wa sirat al-Mustaqim. So the Qur'an is Hablullah. What is al-Urwat al-Wuthqa? Wuthqa means it is not resolvable. You cannot dissolve it, you cannot untie it. It's like a, a very strong knot on the rope. You know, if you hold on to a ro loose rope, no nuts, nothing, and your hand starts to sweat, and you start to keep sliding down. So Allah is saying, don't hold to the rope, hold to the nod. Then you will never slide. The image here is that what Allah says in Surah Al-Asr and in Surah Al-Teen, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ All men are bound to be lost or to be in loss. What is the image here between the ayah of Surah Al Imran, Surah Al Asr, and Surah Al Teen? It is the fact that Allah is drawing an image for us. And the Quran is full of images. Unless you figure it out, you lose what the Quran is saying. The image here is that everyone is thrown from high whether to a, a deep ocean or a serious waterfall or something dangerous or pit fire, okay? Except for those who are holding to that rope. So 
if you loosen a little bit, you take the risk of falling. And this is what the Quran wants us to understand. That holding on to the Quran is our survival kit given by Allah. Without which we are bound to lose and fall. And Allah wants to protect us. So he gives us this image. So here, as he has taken the covenant from Ibrahim, Nuh, and all the prophets, he took the covenant from Moses, Isa, and all other prophets, and all other communities, that once a prophet comes unto you from Allah, confirming whatever revelation that has been given to you, لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَتَنْصُرُنَّ قَالَ أَأَقْرَرْتُمْ وَأَخَذْتُمْ عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ إِصْرِي Allah questions the prophets who conveyed the same commitment to their communities. Have you taken and accepted my covenant? And have you confirmed that you will commit to this covenant? قَالُوا أَصْرَرْنَا قَالُوا أَقْرَرْنَا We confirm. They attested to the covenant. The same was taken from the children of Israel and the followers of Isa and all of them. So here, Allah is threatening the children of Israel by holding on the mount over their head. And I want you to keep those images alive in your head because I want you to go home and read these ayat with your children so that they know what Allah has done to other communities. It is very important. Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, but He is also Shadeed Al Iqab. So we have to be careful because some of us only want to expose our children to what they think are nice qualities of Allah. Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, Allah will get you to paradise, as if Allah will never do anything different. Right? Allah gives you this and gives you that. That is true. But Allah is given. To help us and to test us. Our children need to know that. That Allah is not only merciful. Inna rabbaka la shadeedul iqab wa innahu la ghafoorul rahim. This meaning has to transfer to our children. But we have to believe it first. We have to believe it and practice it. So here, uh, as we did this and we told them, وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ I want you to take this and break it down. When most do you refer to Allah? When you have it hard, when you have a crisis, when you have it tight, when you lose something or someone dear, you go to Allah. But Allah is saying, وَذْكُرُوا, remember. And He is hinging His remembrance of us on our remembrance of him. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ It's a reciprocal relationship. Remember me so that I remember you. So if you remember him at good times, at bad times, before you pray, he's right there. أَسْمَعْ وَأَرَى He sees and he hears without you talking. He knows everything. So if you want Allah to be with you, at the time you need him the most, never pretend that there is a time when you don't need him. Never pretend. This is a situation of people who don't believe. Kalla, inna al insana la yatga arraahu stagna. Man tends to act like a tyrant, not a servant of Allah, not in submission, but tyranny, right? when he thinks he can do without. But can we do without Allah? Can we breathe without Him? Can we even breathe? We can't. So we have to be in constant recognition of our need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what will inspire us to always remember Allah that we can never do without Him, not for a second. But because the toys of this life are very attractive and very distracting, we get distracted. So Allah sent us the Qur'an as an eternal reminder. 
for all of our life. You keep reading it, it keeps giving you more. The more you read, the more a believer you become, provided that you think and ponder and reflect. Don't take it for granted. The purpose of reading the Quran is not to turn written words into spoken words. The purpose is to think. To think and reflect on the ayat that you read. So, children of Israel, they feared and they complied. They said, okay, okay, we'll comply, we'll listen, we'll obey. Then, then you turned away after that kind of threat. Do you know, when a nation threatens a nation, when a powerful nation threatens the weakest nation, they take it to heart because they know destruction is coming, right? When Allah, the powerful one, threatens a community, they must heed the threat. They must heed his command. So they heed it momentarily. And this is what's amazing about, about this community. But we Muslims need to learn. Do we also heed the commands of Allah momentarily? Imagine if we are doing the same thing, even though to maybe a different degree. But imagine how despised we could be when we claim to submit, but only when we want him, when we need him. And we don't submit otherwise. This is betrayal of our covenant. This is treason in the highest order, that you make a commitment with Allah, which we all did when we say, La ilaha illallah, but when it comes to practice, no, I will go to the court because the sheikh will not give me what I want. So we turn our back to Islam because Islam is not going to give me what the civil system would. Amazing. Amazing choice. And the Quran, to address this issue, tells us, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمْ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ A believing man or woman, they have no choice after Allah has spoken. After Allah has rendered his ruling, Muslims don't have a choice, not in inheritance, not in the way they dress, not in the way they behave, not in the way they pick contracts or choices or jobs or anything else. You don't have a choice. Allah gives you the choice to believe in him or not believe in him. He gives you the choice to obey or disobey. But every choice of those has consequences. So while you have the freedom, there is no freedom without responsibility. Not in the real world and not in the spiritual world. Not in the material world, not in the spiritual world. You make a choice, you live with the consequences. But guess why? Why are we able to venture and dare Allah to violate plainly? his command and choose other than his choices it is because we are making a false logic we are saying Allah is Ghafoor Rahim but let us listen Allah says وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ my mercy encompasses everything so as far as mercy he can cover and he does cover the whole world right but then he says, فَسَأَكْتُبُهَا I will prescribe it. I will give it to those who believe. And what? Do what Allah expects of them to do. So if you claim you believe, but violate his rules, that belief is what we called previously useless faith. It did not give you the benefit of believing. So here, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ then you turned away after that. And were it not, were it not for the grace and mercy of Allah upon you, indeed you would have been among the losers. So Allah, after they violated, 
he gives him another yet chance. We went over the ayat in which Allah put them to death, brought them to life, right? Saved them from the children of, from the uh, people of Pharaoh, right? And he provided for them in the desert. And he opened the city of Jerusalem for them and told them, just come in. And when you come in, you will win. They have been a stumbling disobedience after disobedience after disobedience until Moses, according to the Old Testament, prayed to Allah saying, take me away from these people. Put me to death. You imagine why Moses is called one of the strongest profound prophets. The prophets who had very strong resolve. He continued to commit to their service and to their guidance till the last minute. And even when he was on his deathbed, he was worried about them. Look how merciful those prophets have been. So he talks to Allah on his deathbed and he says, God, I am delighted that you take me for me to join you. But what's going to happen to these guys? What's going to happen to the children of Israel? And Allah answers him in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, I will raise for them from among the, their brethren someone like you and I will put my word in his mouth and I will, he will speak in my name, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. And he will teach them the whole truth and he will guide them to my way. This is what Allah promised Moses on his deathbed. So the last quoted discussion between Allah and Musa was about the coming of a prophet like him. And Christians would say, this is Jesus, this is not Muhammad. And I have done a comparative proof to completely exclude that possibility. But that's not the time to, I'll present it for you someday. So the point here is, when we take a commitment with Allah, we better live up to it. This is the lesson that the Quran is bringing to us. Never violate the rules of Allah. And if you do, come back quickly. The only reason that Allah kept forgiving the children of Israel is because when pressed, they go back and they say, Musa, even though the language is unacceptable, the question is unacceptable, it was full of mocking, but they said, oh Musa, ask your Lord to forgive us this time. And when Musa asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always obliged and accepted his prayer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our Islam and help us to practice it the way he expects. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salat wa salam ala ibadi ladin astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdu wa rasul wa ba'd Here it comes the continuation of the story wa laqad alimtum alladhina a'tadaw minkum fi al-sabt fa qulna lahum kunu qiradatan khasi'in We will tackle this inshallah next Friday because the story is much longer than this ayah but uh, I would like to remind everybody that Ramadan is right around the corner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us live to witness this coming Ramadan and help us prepare for this Ramadan and help us succeed in this Ramadan and to make it the best Ramadan that we go through for all of us and for all Muslims. And in Ramadan, Dar al-Hijra always in your name, in your generosity, we host an open iftar for everybody. The purpose of this iftar is twofold. One is to have everybody who needs a meal for iftar to come in. So those who are in need, they come in. And we wanted to also make a good cover for everybody so that the wealthy and the healthy and the well-to-do will come 
to socialize with everybody else and to get to know each other. It's only one month a year, 30 days or 29 days, whatever it is. And the opportunity here is to get closer to each other as we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the cost for this dinner for one person for 30 days is $195. So if you make it rounded to 200 or 250, we will accept it. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all to the best. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt. Wa aafina fi man aafayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik. Wa min taatika ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak. Wa min al yaqeen ma tuhawinu bihi alayna masaib al dunya. Wa matti'na Allahumma bi asma'ina wa abasarina wa quwatina ma ahyaytana. واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر الإسلام وأعز المسلمين وأعلي بفضلك يا رب كلمتي الحق والدين اللهم ارحم أمواتنا وأموات المسلمين واختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات من كل ذنب وأقم الصلاة